Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm chapter 78, verses 5 through 8, and Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Train children in the right way, and when old, they will not stray. We give thanks for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, and for the word of God among us. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom as we receive the word that you have for us today. Give us understanding, open our eyes and our ears, that we might know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ali. So that Proverb 22, um, train your children in the right way, and when old, they will not stray. I want to make one thing clear right off the bat. Um, Proverbs are generally true. And uh, I think we've all seen uh, parents that did a right job and their kids went horribly wrong. We've all seen parents who did a horrible job and their kids somehow went wonderfully right. Am I right? So a proverb, you know, if you're a parent out there that feels guilt about choices or directions that your children um, have chosen, it doesn't mean that you haven't uh, led them in the right way. And, you know, as, as we're reading through this, you're probably thinking, okay, we're going to talk about um, raising children in our home. And, you know, while I am a, a parent of nearly 22 years and I do have some experience to, to offer, I'm not qualified, I'm not trained to stand up here and tell you how to raise kids. And we're not going to do that. I think a lot of times people do um, with Scripture what it was never really intended to do. They kind of do a violence to it. Um, there's a whole um, market out there for Christian uh, media and books that are put out how to parent the biblical way or the Bible as a history book or the Bible as a science book. And I, and I really feel like this kind of does violence to what Scripture is intended to be, which is uh, a love letter to us that God uses to speak into our lives and also how to live out our faith in an intentional way. And so today I'm not going to be talking to you about how to raise your children, but I am going to be looking at this command we are given in Psalm 78, which is how we are to pass on our faith to the next generation. A lot of times we're thinking, okay, so you're talking about to my kids and grandkids. Yes, but this command is a blanket command to God's people. This is not to an individual household. This is to us as the community of believers, our responsibility to mentor the next generation. So when Allie, our family ministries director, gets up here and asks for help in Sunday school or help at our fine arts uh, camp, summer camp, or with the youth programs, you have a literal command telling you you should be saying yes. All right? So I was, that one's for Allie. That's a guilt trip, so if she calls you for volunteer. I don't like guilt trips, but every once in a while, you know. But anyways, it does say in here, it is a command that you do that. We have a responsibility, an obligation. So I'm talking to us about heritage. But of course, in our homes, heritage gets passed down as well. And it happened in my home um, also. You know, when you're a young parent, you kind of you can get ideas in your head that you think this is what makes a good parent, and the, they just kind of get stuck. And later on in life, you might look at those and go, "Well, I don't, you know, it was a good thing, but I don't know if it was that essential." One of those for my mom, and it it made special moments. But she thought a good parent. This is how you define a good parent: a good mother is able to recite poems to her children. So when she was a young mom, she would memorize these different poems and, and say them to us as. 
at, at bedtime, and one of them was Little Orphan Annie. Now, you're probably thinking about the movie, but there was a poem before there was a movie about Little Orphan Annie. And uh, all, all I can remember about that poem is that Little Orphan Annie was taking care of these children. She'd go through this long list of things that naughty children did, and then she would say, and the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. So, so sometimes our heritage might not be on, the, on point, but my mother also taught me I was um, 11 years old. And it was about this time of year, you know, early summer, uh, but school was out, so a little bit later, but early summer days, and my clothes were all dirty. I got up in the morning, I was looking for some clean clothes, and I went to mom and said, Mom, um, I don't have any clean clothes. When are you going to do the laundry? Oops is right. So guess what I did that beautiful, sunny summer morning? I did the laundry, several loads with mom, and I learned how to do it. She said, now you don't ever have to complain about having dirty clothes because you can go wash them yourself. So there was this good heritage that she passed on. So we want to make sure we pass on a good heritage to the next generation. And yes, parents, we make mistakes, like giving our children nightmares when we recite a poem about goblins coming to get them when they're naughty, um, and we don't intend it. But we all make mistakes, but there are those heritage we want to make sure we pass on. And we make mistakes as a church at times. And we need to make room for the next generation to kind of correct those things as we move forward. So Psalm 78, I've taken from this. Now I won't say that the psalmist meant for this to be a literal liturgy of how to pass on the heritage. But he does give us a good road map that we can play with a little bit. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, he gives four commands on how we pass on that heritage. Um, and if you're looking at it, let me just read it again for you. He established a decree in Jacob and then appointed a law in Israel. Uh, essentially all of Israel, all of God's people, Jacob and Israel, the two primary tribes, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So this is a command within the faith community that the next generation might know them. There's why. The children yet unborn. So it's so, uh, such an important thing that even the children unborn, we need to be making plans for them. And rise up and tell them to their children. So how do we pass it on in a way that becomes part of who we are, so much so that the next generation continues to do that work? And here's, here's the framework I want us to kind of hang this on. So that they should set their hope in God. So hope in God. If you're keeping notes here, hope in God. And not forget the works of God. So the works of God. And keep his commandments. And, they should, and that they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation whose heart was not steadfast whose spirit was not faithful to God. So these four areas of heritage that we should be passing on, yes, within our homes, uh, but this is specifically for the faith community as well. To set their hope in God, remember the works of God, keep the commands, and I'm summarizing the last few there, but not to chase after vain idols, things that we hope in that we shouldn't, things that we put trust in that we shouldn't. So I want to talk to us first about kind of that, that hope in God and what that looks like in the home, in the church, or anywhere that you have influence. Um, this, this could be to an older student in school. Uh, this could to towards a younger student. This could be um, for uh, an empty nest mom taking under her wing a young mother and helping her out. In any kind of scenario that... But teaching them to put their hope in God, what does that look like? Um, a lot of times there are good things that, that we talk about and, and um, put a hope in. That maybe we should strive for, but hope should be reserved for God. So let me just say there's some good things. So a lot, one of the things we really push on kids is to get a good education, right? But that's not where our hope should lie. Or to find a good spouse. Important thing to do if you're going to marry, to find a, a good spouse that shares your values. But that's not where our hope lies. 
to find a good paying job or to have a beautiful family. All wonderful things that we can strive for, but they should not be our hope. Hope is when all else fails. And you know, our spouse might not fail us, but they can't provide everything we need, no matter how wonderful they are. A good education is important, but it can't provide the instilled value we need that God can give to us. And we can go on down the list. A, a paying job can provide and, and make maybe life uh, easy to bear with a good financial blessing. But in the end, what we do with those finances will either bless or wreck us if our hope is not in God. That he is the one that won't fail us. And, and why is that? Because especially at this church, we make... Um, we emphasize this aspect of who God is, that God is love. It's right into our values and our mission statement that, that we would love unconditionally like Christ and that we would not judge. And to understand that our hope, our hope is in that love that God offers us. Uh, a lot of times when we hear about hoping in God, we think immediately of, of the commands of God, which are important but they show us how to experience his love and how to share it. And so essential to it is that we experience the love and acceptance of God so that we can have that blessing in our lives. And so the psalmist is saying to us, pass this hope on. All other things are vain. All other things will fall apart on you or fall short. And uh, honestly, it's not fair to put your hope on something like a spouse that is going to strain your relationship or your job that's going to make you feel empty eventually or a perfect household well they're going to grow and they're going to move on and when we put our hope in these things we lift them up into a place that they should not be put your hope in God the psalmist goes on that we should put our hope in God, but um, that we should also uh, keep his commands. What does that look like? Um, have you ever noticed that the more poorly you talk about somebody, the less you like them? Have you noticed that? In my 47 years, it took me a while to learn that. But even if I had a rightful grudge against somebody, the, the more negatively I speak about them, the more I feel awful inside and feel awful towards them. The reverse is also true. The, the more we speak kindness or blessing, even about our enemies, uh, the less we feel that hatred in our heart and the more we extend our love. And, and some of you have experienced those people in your life that love you no matter what. I'm sorry if you haven't had a mother like I have who's blessed you with that sort of love, but my mom loves me when I'm at my worst. She loves me when I'm at my best. She just loves me, right? She has that unconditional love. I hope there's somebody in your life that you've been able to um, see God's love incarnate, at least a glimpse of it in some way, where they just love you for who you are. And that's the command we have going forward to love others the way we have been loved. Um, I don't know if you do this in your household. We do it in ours. We find a favorite TV show or something, and we quote them sometimes because you get lines from them that just fit perfectly. I see some of you nodding your head. I, I, one, of the, one of the shows that we've watched, uh, Seinfeld. Who's familiar with Seinfeld? So Jerry's talking to his mom and dad. They're at his apartment, and... He's talking about some guy that doesn't like him, and his mother stops him and goes, Oh, Jerry, don't say that. How could anybody not like you? You know, you want that kind of love in your life. The dad sits there for a moment and thinks, he goes, I could see it. <laughs> you know, there's that difference between moms and dads, right? And so we quote that line all the time. Oh, how could anybody not love you? So, but God loves us. And this is the command that knowing God is love. And it's not that we put on rose-colored glasses and pretend things aren't difficult. 
It's not unicorn rainbow thinking or uh, uh, Lego language. You know everything is awesome. Sometimes people aren't awesome, right? Sometimes everything isn't awesome. But it's this recognition that we've been called to love and offer that love as it has been offered to us. So we pass on this hope. We put our hope in God. We don't elevate other idols to that place, no matter how good they are. And we keep the commands and we remember Remember the works, the psalmist tells us. That means telling the story. And that was very specific to the Jewish tradition, still is today, still is to our traditions as well, that we would tell the stories of God from Scripture over and over again. But it also means telling our faith stories. So it's not that we have a responsibility only to teach where God was faithful in Scripture, but we have to look in our immediate history and say to the next generation, look at this faith story. It defines who we are. Each church has their own faith stories that we tap into, and I want to share one with you about this church that I've learned. In, uh, you, you've heard probably that Steve Hissong and some many others have been working on um, our heritage of this church, the history of this church. And in a few weeks, they'll be sharing some of that uh, with us. But one of the stories that I found that Steve brought to me, is, Pastor, you have to see this. And he brought this story to me. And it seems like just before the uh, uh, Civil War, this church shrunk dramatically. You see the attendance just being normal, and then all of a sudden it drops. Sound like recent history? You know, a lot of Methodist churches have experienced that. And he said, you know what, I found out why, I, I had to look at why that happened, and I found out the pastor that had been appointed to this church at that time was an abolitionist. And the congregation was divided over slavery. And many thought, you know, slavery ought to end, but really, are black people the same as us? You know? Yeah, they should be able to come worship, but should they be in a pulpit? Should they be in leadership roles? Notice anything? And for some, this pastor was just too bold about the values and rights of an oppressed people, and many left. For some reason, in this community of Auburn, God has chosen the people at this Methodist church to bless with the difficult messages about love and acceptance. For some reason, that's baked into our DNA. And now, before you get really proud and puffed up and want to pat yourself on your back, I'll tell you what my dad tells me. My dad's a pastor. I'm a pastor. Every once in a while, dad will say, God must be awfully desperate. I mean, look who he calls to lead ministry. <laughs> he usually follows it up with, you know, I think he calls people like you and I because he wants to prove it's him, not us doing the work. <laughs> But that's the sort of story we need to be passing on. And there's stories from your small groups. There's stories from your history. There's stories from your service in the church that you have seen. Uh, um, here in a couple Sundays, uh, we're going to hear some stories about ministry that happens on Wednesday nights. That's part of our, our heritage about who we are and how we pass it on. And the final piece, and we won't spend a lot of time on this because we've kind of touched on it a little bit, vain idols. The psalmist says, don't be like that other generation that went chasing after other things. And we sometimes wonder, why did they change the living God for a piece of stone or, or woodwork and worship it? Because those things represented power. They looked at the powerful people around them and said, oh, look what they do. Let's emulate that. And, of course, we would never do that, would we? We wouldn't follow some political figurehead and say, wow, they're powerful, they'll fix everything, let's get behind them. We wouldn't do that, would we? Or maybe we would. But the psalmist reminds them, put your hope in God, not vain idols, not worldly sources of power, but in the power of knowing that God loves you fully and calls you to go out and do your very best to love others in the same way will fall short. 
So I want to offer, Allie does a great job with her kids' messages because she always has a very clear response, right? Here's what I want you to do this week. So here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to be in prayer about who it is in your life, and I want you to, uh, you know, yes, your children, your grandchildren, be intentional there, but I want you to think beyond that because this command is for the community I want you to think about who is it that you need to be passing your faith heritage on to. I know some of you are going, well, wait a minute. My, my faith has been shaky. I haven't always lived it. Guess what? There's somebody else out there whose faith is shaky and who hasn't always lived it, and they want to know how you've remained in the faith. They want to hear that story. They need to hear that story. There's a mom out there that's struggling and needs some help. There, there's a new family who are becoming in, empty nesters and they need an older couple to tell them how they managed not to kill each other when <laughs> the, the house got empty, right? Simple things like this, life experiences that you've had and you've allowed God to speak into it and now you need to speak into the lives of those who are coming up so that you can pass that heritage on to them and make room. I want to make this clear as well that we need to make room as we pass that heritage on. We're passing it on, we're handing it to the next generation. When we do it, it is theirs to shape. We have that wonderful uh, broken bowl that is our baptismal fount. It is made of the pieces of the past, but the next generation puts its mark on it. Some of the things that I preach today um, are things that would be considered heresy in the past or controversial right? Slave, remain a slave. Woman, stay quiet in the church. Uh, obey your husband, right? These things that we say, okay, we understand the full breadth of Scripture. It's a little bit different today. Some of the things I'm saying today, probably 100 years from now, people would go, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said that in the pulpit. Of course, they, they won't be me, and they're not going to record my messages 100. But some of the things we collectively believe they're going to look at and roll their eyes at, just like we roll our eyes at some of the things that were believed in the past. So when we hand off that heritage, it's theirs. It's between them and God. Allow them to put their own stamp, their own mark upon it. But your challenge is go out. Teach others to put their hope in God. Teach them to follow those commandments of, of loving others. Uh, Teach to them to remind the next generation of the works that God has done and to not put hope in vain places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the heritage of faith and help us to be faithful in passing it on. Uh, whether we're a mother, a father, an empty nester, a single Whatever our experience is in life, there is someone in that coming generation that needs to hear how you've worked in our lives. We pray we would be bold enough to do so. And Lord, as, uh, as we pray for that wisdom to see who or where it is we need to uh, offer that teaching for the next generation, pray you would open our eyes, give us a clear place or person that we're meant to minister to. It's in your name we pray. Amen.